us to here. <laughs> Like the managers recognized. Happy. Okay, enough commentary here. <laughs> we need to get started. As a preliminary matter, this is the Thursday, March 23rd regular board meeting of SBCC and we have, if you have not previously noticed this in reading the agenda, we have added the vision statement to the mission statement at the beginning of the agenda. That's the vision statement we adopted at our last meeting. So calling this meeting to order, we have all of our trustees present and accounted for. Welcome to our audience who is um, obviously interested and a little bigger than usual, and we're happy to have you. Uh, our first item here is 2.4, which is the Administrator of the Year. And Anthony, do you want to introduce that? Yeah, let me just say a little bit about this. We, our Advancing Leadership Committee here at Santa Barbara City College annually recognizes an outstanding Administrator of the Year, and we have Pat English, Dan Watkins, and Marsha Wright that are going to present this item. So if they'd come down to the lectern, we can continue. I think Pat's up first. Pat is up first. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, members of the board and President Beebe. It's nice to see you all. Beginning in 2013, the management group of Santa Barbara City College, which is now known as the Advancing Leadership Committee, began recognizing the Outstanding Administrator of the Year. The primary purpose of this award is to honor colleagues who demonstrate excellence in their administrative role at SBCC and who are exemplary role models for all administrators and employees. Nominees must meet several eligibility criteria, such as having a current satisfactory evaluation on file and be current in their own staff evaluations. They also must be a participant in the Management Professional Growth Program. This year, we received 10 nominations, but only seven met these eligibility requirements. There are 51 members of the ALC, and we had 43 votes gathered, so that's pretty darn good participation. Although the nominations may be made by any permanent employee, the winners are determined by a vote limited to the management group only. This recognition is very special because it comes from our peers. Previous winners include Marsha Wright, who's behind me. She was the winner the first year in 2013. I was honored in 2014. Dan Watkins was honored in 2015. And Karen Safaya, who retired last year, won last year. Once again this year, we owe a debt of gratitude to the SBCC Foundation for generously underwriting the cash awards that are associated with this recognition. So if there aren't any questions about the program itself, we can proceed to announce the results of the vote. Do you have any questions about the program? So to keep you in suspense, we're going to start with the honorable mentions. Marcia, did you have a question? No, I think no one has a question. Okay. We're in we are Except we are in, one. We're in suspense. Okay, good. Good. Okay. Good afternoon. It's an honor to be here to recognize two of my outstanding peers that I really admire and truly enjoy working with. The first this nomination for this outstanding Administrator of the Year 2017 Honorable Mention Award winner was supported by 10 individuals. This individual is described as a passionate believer in the mission of the college, able to advocate for the needs of the department while balancing college-wide budgetary concerns. The great sense of humor and positive spirit during challenging times brings out the best in everyone. This person is accessible, accommodating, fair, 
and responsive, and their leadership style keeps department morale extremely high. The individual lives with joy, focus, and determination, with an incredible sense of grace towards and with other people, respectful to everyone at all times. This person has, with, has been with Santa Barbara City College since 2000. We are speaking about Carola Smith, the Senior Director of the International Student Services Support Program and Study Abroad Program. Carola. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for this unexpected honor. It has been such an honor to work at Santa Barbara City College. I'm a former international student it's from Santa Barbara City College, and I'm really honored. I know who the other nominees are, are and I know that all of them are really deserving, so thank you. <laughs> the roller receives a certificate and a check. Thank you to the foundation. The second honorable mention that I'm going to speak about, I'm extremely passionate about, and personally have nominated this individual. Described as a truly inspirational leader, provides the highest quality of support, professionalism, and a can-do spirit. Always the first to give credit to and empower others. Sensitive, compassionate, a true collaborator, 100% committed to SBCC. He leads staff with passion and commitment. There's a drive to continually improve upon processes to serve students in the best possible way. Understands the mission of the college and whatever is undertaken is done with passion and commitment by him and his staff. This individual has been employed by Santa Barbara City College again since 2000, just babies in my eyes. <laughs> Starting out as a staff member before being promoted into management in 2005. Prior to 2000, he was a student here at Santa Barbara City College. Noteworthy, he also met his wife here. Congratulations to my friend and colleague, Jason Walker. Well, I'm, I'm shocked. I was certainly trying to figure out who she was talking about until she said that he met his wife, and I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> um, wow, I'm, I'm honored. I thank you very much. I'm, I'm touched. And again, like Carola said, the list of, uh, the list of uh, people that were selected, honestly, I, I assumed that uh, probably any one of about five of them would be up here and not me. So I'm, I'm humbled, and I just want to put a shout out to all the others. Thank you. Good afternoon, board members. It's my turn to announce two of our honorable, mench our honorable nominees. So I will start with the first one. This individual was nominated by two colleagues. Some of the terms used to describe this manager include skillful communicator, creative ideas, conflict resolution, trustworthiness, innovative, sense of humor, honesty, integrity, worthy of respect. This individual has served SBCC for more than eight years in a leadership capacity, having been involved in numerous college committees and also performing a great deal of work behind the scenes for the college. This individual is in the unsung hero category among us. Going forward, this individual will likely be forced out from behind the scenes as he is 
been named the Chief Information Security Officer for SBCC. Congratulations to Jim Clark, Director of Information Technology User Services, for being named an Outstanding Administrator on the Administrator Award. Didn't have anything prepared to say because I didn't think I'd be up here, but because uh, I'm in good company. I mean, all the nominees are awesome, and uh, I, I, I feel honored to be honored. Um, <laughs> so thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and the next. The next person we have, and it's our last honorable nominee before we get to the big reveal. Uh, we received nomination information for the next Outstanding Administrator of the Year 2017 Honorable Mention Award winner from eight separate individuals who work closely with this person. I'd like to share with a few of the statements that we received. No administrator has worked harder and deserves this award, award more. The type of manager who engages everyone in a positive manner listens well and solves issues right away. A wonderful role model, a committed professional, and a warm person. Exudes confidence and sets a good example with a work ethic and brilliance as a leader. Honest, ethical, compassionate, and trustworthy. A wise counselor, a bearer of integrity and civility. Empathetic leadership style. Working with this person has been a gift. Also an eight-year veteran of SBCC, congratulations to the Educational Programs Dean, Melissa Moreno. This is really a nice moment, um, but I, you know, when I found out I was nominated, I uh, connected with all of uh, the team that's here that nominated me and told them I, I already won. I mean, that was just an incredible experience in the moment to read everything that was written about me, and um, you know, so I'm humbled by that and, and what people had said about me, and I just wanted to thank everybody who participated in my nomination from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be a part of this community. Thank you. Thank you. So now for probably the worst kept secret or surprise in the history of the college, <laughs> I have the privilege of, of reading from some of the nomination forms. The Outstanding Administrator of the Year 2017 was nominated by at least 28 individuals. It was more like a petition. <laughs> The descriptive words that I am privileged to share barely begin to acknowledge the contributions made over a 26-year career at SBCC and legacy that will remain when this person retires at the end of this year. She has had a profound impact on her colleagues at SBCC. I will read a few quotes. In every position she has held, she has excelled yet never sought the spotlight. Her strong but quiet leadership style shines through in everything she does, whether she is mentoring a colleague, solving a problem, or supporting faculty in one of her departments, she is always calm, competent, and caring. Marilyn is a wonderful listener and she is adept at taking into account multiple perspectives from various stakeholders before making decisions. She always performs her work with respect for others. She is simultaneously the ultimate professional and a thoughtful humanitarian. She has an intuitive understanding of the way different individuals interact with one another. This is manifested as an innate ability to make people feel comfortable and to communicate very effectively. She is a true friend and cherished member of the Sciences Division. She has earned the title of, quote, quite a bit more than just an honorary biologist, unquote. <laughs> she handles high-stress situations with aplomb and ease. 
Marilyn epitomizes truly great leadership. She is remarkably intelligent, warm, kind, hardworking, and gracious. She is meticulous with detail and boundless in her vision. I always feel inspired in her presence, motivated to try to match her energy and spirit and grace. Tireless advocacy for students is inspiring. She pours her heart and mind into her work and it elevates us all. Marilyn embodies excellence. We are better because of her and we will miss her dearly. There are also innumerable words of gratitude and praise from the nominators across the institution for stepping up and into the role of interim executive vice president twice, protecting our institution from further disruption during a difficult season. Gratitude for tireless support of grants and various product, projects, we know you have our backs. She befriends everyone she meets. One author said that when trying to solve a problem, one question they ask themselves is, what would Marilyn do? <laughs> Defined, described uniformly as an incredible mentor, role model, and colleague, humble to the bone. We are all humbled to be your colleagues as you are named, Outstanding Administrator of the Year. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who knows me, and some of you are out there, know how embarrassed I am by attention. <laughs> so this is really hard. And when I saw my husband sitting there, I almost walked out the door. <laughs> um, everybody also knows how much I love my job and how easy it is to do your job here with so many amazing people. Like uh, Melissa said, the comments meant so much to me. I sent them to my children <laughs> and said, this is work, mom. You don't know me that way. Um, but it meant a lot to be able to share that with them. So thank you for this honor. Thank you, Kathy. So that was, uh, that was really wonderful, very touching. I think it's the first time I've ever seen uh, Jim Clark and Jason Walker kind of without words to be able to express themselves. It doesn't happen very often. Congratulations to Marilyn. It's very, very well deserved. And uh, we're certainly proud of all of the, the nominees and, and Marilyn. Well, I, I echo that. I mean, uh, Congratulations to all of the nominees. Clearly, you have the respect and admiration of your colleagues. And Marilyn, uh, 28 nominations, that really says it all. <laughs> so congratulations. Um, our, next, our next item is recognitions. And I believe we do not have anyone here today. No. Nope. Other None. than what we did right. just now. That's it. Mm -hmm. Let's give people a moment to clear. They weren't really interested in what we do here, are they? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's spring break. What? Oh, it's spring break. That's why. Okay. <laughs> I think it's wonderful, though. I, I just while we're waiting, uh, I didn't realize that they uh, that that I thought. They always gave Administrator of the Year, but it's a short, you know, time that it's been, it's even been offered, and I think it's a wonderful idea, you know? Oh, it is, definitely. So often the administrators are the ones that we kind of ignore. <laughs> yes. You know, they do a good job, but. Yes. It's been quiet. <laughs> 
unrecognized. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That middle management thing sometimes. Okay, moving on to 3.1, minutes of the regular meeting of February 23rd, 2017. May I have a motion to approve the minutes? Jonathan? Second? Craig? And any comments? Mar Marty? I just, I just wanted to comment. Uh, I really like the new format with the bullet points. I don't know why it makes it so much easier to read, but it really does, and so much clearer, too. So thank you for doing that. Well, you have Angie to thank for that. Yeah. She worked that through. That's good. Thanks. So. I do have two corrections. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see them. I was looking at the bullet points. On um, page two, under uh, 5.4, report from superintendent, the last sentence, I'm deleting other, the S after discussions, and also to correct that sentence to make it read a little easier. And then the other one is on page four. The second sentence should be followed rather than follow. Okay. All right, those are my corrections. <laughs> okay, with those corrections, uh, Jonathan, you're okay. Craig, yeah. you're okay. <laughs> um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Minutes have passed. Okay. Now uh, we go to public comment. We have um, one slip with two names uh, who uh, want to speak to us in the public comment time period, and that's Sophia Stefan Stefanovich. Vic, I'm really not doing a good job there. And love, hmm. Lauren? Is it Lauren Russ? One of you needs to be a uh, doctor to write prescriptions. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sofia Stefanovic and I'm the president of the Feminist Club of the School. I'm Lauren Russ and I'm vice president of the Feminist Club of SBCC. And we wanted to be here in support of multi-stalled gender neutral bathrooms. And also we're asking to suspend the rules of the day and move to 12.1. Thank you. Would the board prefer to address 12.1 now or wait um, for where we have it under re information reports? I'm guessing that a lot of people are here for that particular yeah. reason and would prefer to leave shortly thereafter, although they should feel completely welcome to stay throughout our entire <laughs> and exciting <laughs> meeting. But I would, I would suggest we, we honor their request. Yeah. That's fine. It's good. Apparently, we're not feeling educational by letting them sit through our meeting, huh? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll go to 12.1, and the first element there is for Anthony to give us an update and informational discussion. No, we're doing the information first, and then we will do public comment. Oh, okay. Um, this really is an important topic and I'm proud of the state of California for taking a national leadership role in the area of gender neutral restrooms. Assembly Bill 1732 was approved by Governor Brown in September on September 29th of 2016 and I just wanted to read a, a bit of the, the law here and it says all single user toilet facilities in any business establishment, place of public accommodation, or state or local government agency shall be identified as all gender toilet facilities. Um, I'm pleased to be able to report to the board that the college is in compliance with this new law, which actually just took effect 
March 1st of 2017. So it's, you know, the implementation date of that is, is brand new. Um, just wanted to give you some numbers uh, of our gender neutral bathrooms that we have on campus. Currently, we have a total of 15 gender neutral bathrooms uh, on the campus. Now, if we split those up and, and uh, look at how many we have on the East Campus and how many we have on the West Campus, we have 12 gender neutral bathrooms, single stall, on the East Campus, uh, where the majority of our, of course, students are in classrooms. And then we have um, three gender neutral uh, bathrooms on the West Campus. The good news is, is that by summer, um, and of course we, this has been a, a topic of our discussions at President's Cabinet and such, but by summer we'll have an additional two uh, restrooms, gender neutral restrooms, on the West Campus. And by January, when the West Campus building is going to be completed, an additional three gender neutral bathrooms. This will bring us to a total of 20 gender neutral bathrooms. Um, single stall bathrooms in, on the entire college campus, which is significant. Um, so I just wanted to make sure I gave you those numbers so you know what it is that uh, we're talking about in terms of, of uh, our meeting the law that, that was passed and implemented uh, March 1st of 2017. And um, just to make sure people understand, the law applies to the single stall bathrooms. And that's what we are talking about with the 20 single stall bathrooms. That's correct. That's okay. correct. All right. Um, now we can go to public comment. And I have um, Ainsley Meyer. <laughs> Hello, my name is Ainsley and I'm the president of the LGBT plus club on campus. Um, I wanted to thank you all for having as many gender neutral bathrooms as you do have on campus. Um, we really do appreciate that, but we're not asking for single stall restrooms. We want to see more multi stall gender neutral bathrooms on campus. Um, having gender neutral multi stall bathrooms on campus sends a message to our community and as a community college, I believe that it's our job to set an example. Um, when you have multi-stall gender neutral bathrooms and you're not making students who identify as trans or don't feel comfortable going into gendered bathrooms, when you make them walk to different separate restrooms, that's not equal and that's not inclusive. I have a couple letters here that some students wrote and I'm gonna read them to you. Okay. Having a campus with easily accessible multi-stalled Gender neutral bathrooms matters to me because every student and person deserves to express his, her, their gender identity and have bathrooms that will make them feel comfortable. Let's make SBCC as hospitable, accessible, and comfortable as we can and be examples for our community. I hope when you make a decision regarding multi stalled restrooms, you read the vision statement of our school because that's very important and I think that this is important to the entire student body. Ainsley? Ainsley. <laughs> I, we don't usually comment, but, but I thought I would take this opportunity. Um, inherent in our vision statement, the one that we just adopted, is the idea that f students will learn to argue both sides of an issue. Of course. And um, you have presented one of the sides, and I wanted to give you the opportunity to argue the other side. Okay. Um, so you want me to argue? I'm not sure what you're To asking. argue the other side of the issue that you're proposing. Um, I understand that some people might feel that having gender neutral restrooms could increase chances of assault. Um, in 2014, there were 150 campuses with multi-stalled gender neutral restrooms, and there were no rises in instances of assault in those restrooms. Um, as far as comfortability goes, I think we should show the community that this isn't about the comfort of the majority. We should show that 
the minority is just as important as the majority on our campus. Does anyone have any specific concerns they have? Well, I was suggesting that you argue for the other point of view. I recognize that you're kind of arguing both sides there. Mm -hmm. um, if you were of the other opinion, what would be your argument? If I may? Oh, she, I think she did. Um, I understand your point, but um, this is our vision. Our vision is that students will learn to argue both sides, and I wonder, give her the opportunity to do this. If you don't want to do that, that's okay. I'm, okay. I'm not trying to make you do something you don't want to do. I think it's something um, we hope. Well, because I'm here to argue for multi-stall gender-neutral bathrooms, I don't really have a case prepared for the side I'm not arguing for. Yeah. So okay. thank you for letting me speak. Thank okay. you. Okay, Evelyn Friedman. My name is Evelyn, and I just uh, wanted to kind of speak off of kind of going off what Ainsley has said, that there's like people who here who don't feel comfortable using either the, fem the female bathrooms or the male bathrooms, and I'm kind of like, I guess, one of those people because uh, I kind of don't really identify as either because like, I kind of feel like I'm kind of male, I guess. Sometimes in other days I feel like I'm more feminine and kind of don't really know what bathrooms I should use. But since like my gender, like my, the gender that I was born with is female, so I just would probably have to use the female bathroom. And I just like don't feel comfortable just going into the female bathrooms. And so I just feel like we should have like gender neutral bathrooms, which kind of what I would feel more comfortable using. And just wanted to kind of speak up for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. Matt. I know. Um, Max Pagano. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Max Pagano. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, theirs. Um, I identify as agender, which means no gender at all. I'm not a man. I'm not a woman. And um, so for me personally, this issue of gender neutral bathrooms is not about my comfort. It's about my safety. I feel unsafe using the gendered bathrooms anywhere because the fact is that trans people risk harassment going not only just existing in the world, but um, especially going into such a strictly gendered space like a bathroom. Um, so I, um, I would, yeah, I would feel, it's not really that I would feel more comfortable using a multi-stall gender neutral restroom, but I would feel safe. Um, Dos Pueblos High School currently has a multi-stall gender-neutral restroom that um, was implemented last spring, and um, they haven't had problems that um, were, I haven't heard of any problems. Um, um, and yeah, uh, so gender-neutral restrooms that are multi-stall are achievable for our school um, and um, oh my gosh sorry I keep losing my train of thought um, the and although it's really impressive the number of single stall gender neutral restrooms we have it's important to note that um, at 
least seven of those, I think, are in one building on campus, the humanities building, um, which is really great, but that's on the furthest side of campus and none of the other restrooms are so like clearly marked and clearly accessible that I didn't even know there were any other ones until last week on the entire campus. So even the ones that, and the only other ones that I am aware where they are, are in the library. And for that one, it's still not incredibly clear and you have to go through a door that says staff only, um, which causes a lot of confusion. Um, so, yeah, I think that more gender neutral bath bathrooms that are spread out um, among all the buildings on campus is vital um, because it just, it's not fair to expect not only students like myself, but um, other people who can benefit from gender neutral bathrooms, like people with children who are different genders from them, or um, people with disabilities who have caretakers that are different genders than them, um, can also benefit from multi stall gender neutral bathrooms. So that's why. Thank you. Okay, Anthony. You know, I, I really appreciate those comments. Thank you so much for, for, uh, for making those. You, I really appreciate the idea that um, it's difficult to find some of these bathrooms, and we, we recognize that. And uh, there's a couple things that we've been looking into. One is um, definitely having better signage and wayfinding uh, relative to the bathrooms. And, you know, as... as uh, different as this may uh, sound, we're also looking into the idea of an app to be able to find bathrooms so that, you know, yeah, so that to make it easier in terms of wayfinding and those kinds of things. So there's, there's a couple things that, to your point, um, that I think we can do better relative to, to those kinds of things. So, so we're, we're working to try to, to help with what you're talking about relative to trying to find them. Okay, David Pan Pan Becci. Hello, everyone. Um, President uh, Bibi, President Croninger, uh, fellow trustees, thank you so much. Um, I want to thank you guys for opening a discussion on such an important issue. I want to thank Emily and Jonathan um, for their great work in moving our society forward in a progressive way. My name is David Penbechi. I serve our student body as commissioner of events on the ASG. I helped organize the sit-in on the bridge last week and drafted uh, the petition which calls for gender neutral bathrooms on campus. Really quick before I continue, I wanna make a comment on President Beebe's um, introduction. The issue is no one knows where these bathrooms are. I didn't even know that there were 15 bathrooms. Our uh, student life office doesn't know where they are. So um, that, that's an issue. I want to begin by asking you all a simple question in a simple scenario. The biology building has two restrooms. A gender non-conforming student is on the third floor and needs to use the bathroom. Will this board really look at that student with a straight face and tell them to walk 10 minutes in order to use a single stalled bathroom, a hidden bathroom? What's the morality of that and the justice of that? A few weeks ago, Trustee Gallardo said, what is going to give someone safety because of a bathroom, for example, now will cause a lot of fear for someone else. You went on to say, someone who has been a fourth or fifth generation grandmother may not agree with this new vision, the vision statement, and that grandmother may not be comfortable with her world being transformed for her grandchildren. If a student came to you 100 years ago and said, I think we need a socially conscious society which welcomes black Americans, would you say the same thing? Would you say that the grandmother who, had, who has witnessed inequality her whole life does not want to see her white children go to school with black children? Would you say to that socially conscious student that white Americans will have fear and that I do think of it from both sides like that? Trustees, I plead with you. There is objective morality in this world. There is no nonpartisan way. We have a president of the United States who has rolled back the rights of tra transgender students in Title IX. We have a president in his mini regime who is hunting down Latino children on their way to school. That's actually happening, in case no one knew that. 
that is immoral and that assessment is not and this is the last quote i promise based on how i feel the world should be children should not be hunted down gender non-conforming students should not be immor ignored it is immoral period regarding gender neutral bathrooms it is moral to say that someone who does not conform to a gender must be given the same equality as anyone else the same equality no one should have to walk to another building even for one extra second in order to use the bathroom and when we the students come forward with objective moral proposals i would hope that this body would recognize that sexual assault and harassment of women and men are all despicable i realize a woman was sexually assaulted a few years ago at sbcc but today there are transgender and gender non-conforming students sexually assaulted and harassed every semester this is not a competition which says the winner of sexual assault gets the keys to the bathroom. This is not a competition to say who is more uncomfortable. This is a situation where we have students who do not identify and their rights are being imposed due to security concerns. That is wrong. The principle is that morality does not manifest itself in barring refugees out of fear. The principle is that all because men believe that women will make them feel insecure in the workplace, it does not give them the right to impose on those women. Security cannot impose itself on someone else's rights. Every single person who has opposed this proposal after rig rigorous discussion has concluded that two gender neutral bathrooms per building is the objectively moral thing to do. Conservative, liberal, old, young. That has been the conclusion of every single opponent of this legislation. And the reason for this is that we understand that our uncomfortability must not impose on someone else's rights. We understand the immorality of forcing a gender non-conforming student to walk to a different building in order to use the restroom because we feel uneasy about sharing a bathroom with the opposite sex. We have decided that equality and togetherness is the answer. This decision was put on display at the SBCC bridge in this petition, the petition that um, 500 students have signed, and it will continue just as every movement has continued until the struggles of the LGBT community ends. Trustees, this is a disaster. We have a problem on our hands. After beginning this campaign, I had students coming up to me saying they feel invisible. They said they feel invisible. Is this what we stand for? Is this what SBCC, a school which I love so much, will stand for? There is a gaping wound in our society, a wound which is tearing wider and wider every day. Parts of society have now apparently become numb to grabbing women by their vaginas. Women are treated as objects, not as human beings. Transgender students are not even seen. We have harassment and assault on college campuses. And then we're confronted with a vote, a vote which can determine the societal impact and structure for generations to come, a vote which can be a light onto other college campuses. As a representative giving a voice to the vulnerable students on this campus, giving voice to the over 500 signatures on this petition, to the women and the LGBT community, I implore you, vote yes to establish two gender neutral bathrooms per building. Vote yes so that the transgender student who feels invisible at the greatest community college in this country will not be required to walk from the third story of one building to another building. Vote yes so that we bring our people together as a symbol of hope in this time of darkness. Thank you. By the way, this is an informational item. It's not even noticed for discussion, so right. uh, we'll limit our I'd, further I'd comments. I'd like to talk with the students for a minute, with your permission. Sure. Um, uh, this is not about the issue per se. I've been enormously impressed with the uh, amount of work you've done, and I am not questioning whether you are right or wrong. <clears throat> but I do want to say one thing about the presentations. As somebody who's been around a long, long time and been on both sides of a lot of really tough issues, if you want to succeed in general on an issue that is very emotional, especially if it's emotional for you, as it is in this case, obviously, by your really excellent presentations, 
One of the first things you need to do, and I believe that is why our president asked what she asked, is to be expert on the other side. You need to know what those students who would disagree with you would say and how they would feel. That doesn't mean you need to represent them, but you need to be sure you know them. Now, maybe you do, but that didn't come across in the presentations. So I'm just mentioning to you, and this has nothing directly to do with the issue you're talking about, because I have said the same thing to many other students, presenting many other issues they really cared about. Excuse me, but nobody can hear you if you're back there, and we do have a process here, so let me consult. Um, if someone... Um, I think we have two folks who want to speak. Ainsley, you have spoken, and um, that's fine. You can come back up and speak. And the other person whose name i forgotten, I so, I'm sorry, I did meet you. Oh, Crystal. Crystal, okay. Uh, so Ainsley and Crystal, if you'd like to come up, I don't want to prolong this too long. It is informational, and um, we have a, a number of other items to get to. Hello again. I just want to say it's not my job to present the other side. Um, if they cared enough, they could have been there and done that for themselves. It's my job to defend the side of inclusivity and I would like to make this campus a more inclusive place. And having multi-stalled gender neutral restrooms shows the campus that it doesn't matter what your gender expression is, it matters that you're here to learn. And I checked the vision statement and I would like you to cite the part that says I need to um, defend the opposite side of the opinion that I am defending. The statement does not say that. It's inherent in the statement and in the discussion that we have had about it. I think if you might want to reread Dr. Beebe's waypoint on the vision statement. I, can um, you cite something, though? Yes, Dr. Beebe's waypoint on the vision statement and the process that led up to it. But I don't want to get into a debate. I mean, I think, as Marianne said, I agree, and thank you, Marianne, that it's important to understand all viewpoints. Of course, That's what we're trying to get to. Yeah, but we and already know what, where you stand with this. We've heard quotes from things that you've said regarding this, and I don't think it's very fair for you to make us stand up here and defend a side that doesn't care about the rights of my community. Yes. With Emily? your permission. Okay. Just briefly, I, I think the point here that I think you're missing a little bit is that the way to make good decisions is to really understand both sides of an issue. And some issues even have three or four sides or slants, and some, and maybe the issue needs to get re, maybe some issues need to be redefined. But what we didn't see, myself included, and I'm not going to piggyback on. I I, I thought Marianne made an excellent statement, some really great advice. What didn't come through to me is a feeling that, um, that you really maybe understood the other side and why they feel that way. Um, it's, none of these decisions are really easy, are really easy for anybody necessarily. And it, it is difficult to, to make or it's easy to make some statements, but it's difficult to really justify those statements unless you can understand the whole issue. Um, I do commend you for coming and speaking and, and uh, being involved and, and going about it in a proper way. Um, I would have liked to, to have felt something that didn't come through. Now I feel like a coach on uh, the voice or something. That Before I leave, watches. I just want to say, as an LGBT person, I'm tired of explaining to people that are not part of the LGBT community. Well, I'm tired of explaining these things to people that aren't part of my community, so I don't feel it's right for you to stand there and tell me 
to try and argue a side that doesn't care about me as a person. I, I didn't, I didn't say for you to argue it's that okay. other side. I didn't ask that. And earlier when you said you, I didn't know who you were really addressing. I, um, I give up for now. Thank you. <laughs> Crystal. Hi. Hi, everybody. I'm Crystal Farmer. Um, I think as a straight female, I, I am the other side. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. That's important to announce when you're working with the LGBTQ plus community, their pronouns. Um, from the other side, I was very misinformed. Um, I was not for gender neutral bathrooms before. Um, and I think what a lot of people are lacking is the education on what the gender neutral bathrooms are. I didn't know that they also could stand for, say, I, ha I have children. Say my boyfriend is on campus and I can't take my daughter to the bathroom and she needs to go to the bathroom. They can use a multi-stall gender neutral bathroom. We have lots of uh, handicapped students on this campus. Say they have a caretaker and they need to use the bathroom they can use a multi solid gender neutral bathroom. So I think when it comes to it, um, it's just a lot of misinformation about what these gender neutral bathrooms can go and the, how they can be for many people from different communities. And once I was educated on the matter, I mean, I even said at the Senate, like, wow, I feel very ignorant. I feel very stupid. I apologize because I'm sitting here thinking, oh, I'm at risk, oh, sexual harassment, when really there's so many situations where these multi multi-stall gender neutral bathrooms could be of use and I think that we need to look into that and stop taking an individualistic view on things and feeling so you know oppressed with certain situations and oh it's me it's about me it's about me and look at it in a structural view and how everybody that it can better with these multi-stall gender neutral bathrooms I know that if as a straight woman if I had a single stall bathroom that was far from my class or I'm asking staff faculty that don't even know where the bathrooms are that's going to make me feel like I'm not welcomed here on this campus so I'd just like to say that sometimes it is people being misinformed but if you do the education that you see that it not just has to do with sexual harassment, that it can be f for multiple people in different communities. That's all I'd like to say. Thank you. <laughs> I hate to be rude, but it seems like some of you haven't, didn't hear my speech. That was my speech. My speech was both sides. Um, I said that if someone's uncomfortable, I get that. I'm uncomfortable. I don't want to go to a bathroom with my sister. But that's, that's not the point. The point is my uncomfortability can't impose on someone else. And then we talked about um, the black Americans in my speech. And a simple question, if this was 100 years ago, would we be talking about both sides? Or, or do we understand that there's objective morality? Meaning there's, there's the right thing to do, and then there's the wrong thing to do. And if we're in the wrong, we don't say, oh, let's look at the wrong and the right. We say, let's move towards the right. That's, that's kind of how it works. Um, so I, I did address that. I addressed the sexual assault. Um, yes, women have been sexually assaulted. Maybe, maybe not, there will be a spike. I don't know. But all I know is that the transgender and gender nonconforming students are also sexually assaulted. And I said that this isn't a competition between who is getting more sexually assaulted, so who gets to use the bathroom. This is about, we have a situation, right? We have male and female bathrooms, two bathrooms in EBS. And as a board, because this, this is the representation of the school, the, the voice of the school, at the end of the day, this is the law. Are we going to say to the gender nonconforming student, the law is you have to walk from the third floor of EBS, biology building, to humanities? If we're going to say yes, in my view, in the view of the students here, I think in the view of objective morality, that's wrong. That's my view. That's the view of the students here. I hope that's your view. I hope it's the view that black Americans who were segregated, white Americans felt that there was going to be violence coming in. They felt like they were going to feel uncomfortable. Too bad. Your uncomfortability can't impose on their rights. This is a public institution. If it was private, maybe, maybe you could make the argument. But this is not a private institution. So that, that's all I want to say. I mean, I, I hope maybe this, this thing will be on YouTube. You can watch my speech again. I did address both sides. So thank you so much. Thank you, David. We know your passion. <laughs> Emily. Thank you. Uh, and I just would like to thank the students that came out and spoke today. Um, this has definitely been an issue um, 
for some time now on campus and to hear students uh, come to myself and to my colleagues and say that they're feeling invisible. Um, it was, it's our due diligence to um, listen to them. And so I'd like to take into consideration, um, because as an aspiring lawyer myself, I um, do love counter arguments. I love the idea of um, what is the other side, right? I really, I firmly believe in order to master your um, theory, to master your um, ideas or your proposition, you have to master um, the opposition. But the opposition in this case is simply the continuation of segregation. So um, as a progressive student, I couldn't support um, my fellow students arguing in favor of the continuation of segregation. Um, besides traditional values and besides fear-based false rhetoric, there is no reason to why multi-stall gender neutral restrooms should not be installed at this institution. We have been on the leading end of progression for years and to stop now is an embarrassment. Um, there is a, since um, the uh, transgender community is uh, quote labeled as a uh, hard to reach um, demographic solely because they're so new um, to policy making and vocal um, activism. There's not been so many case studies on um, gender neutral restrooms, but a very interesting one that came out of uh, UCLA Law School, the Williams Institute, titled Gender Neutral Restrooms and Minority Stress, the Public Regulation on Gender and Its Impact on Transgender People's Lives, um, provides some fantastic statistics on what it is like for transitioning men and women and non-binary um, students on what it is like to be gender, um, to be gender neutral. And I think some of the um, quotes that I would like to read, some of the statistics that I would like to read, um, and excuse me if I get emotional. In the largest survey of trans people to date, transgender and gender nonconforming people have reported being fired due to anti-transgender bias at a rate of 26% being harassed at a rate of 78%, physically assaulted at school at a rate of 35%, and suicide attempts at 41%. Um, the suicide attempts rates, the rates of self-harm in this community, it's staggering and it's sickening, and if we can do anything to lower that number, as public servants, it is our job. So I'd like to continue and just read some more um, facts. I'd love to send this over. There's some um, statistics on how many transgender and non-binary um, students continue on to higher education. Uh, there are um, just a, so many uh, bountiful surveys throughout this. Uh, I just spent all last night and a couple nights reading this, but one of the um, testimonies to single stall uh, restrooms, and although we get to say we provide gender neutral restrooms on campus by having single stall restrooms, for myself, and I would like to speak on behalf of some of the students, that is like a duh moment. It's one of those moments in politics that's like, well, congratulations, you, it's a no-brainer. We, every single stall bathroom in houses are non, are gender neutral, right? So why would single stall restrooms at an institution be gender segregated, right? So it's one of those moments, right? And it's a bare minimum providing single stall. So we hope to gain multi-stall restrooms because of a quote of a transitioning man, he wrote, this is in reference to a um, on-campus single stall restroom. The one in the guidance office are supposed to be unisex, but they are still marked men, women. 
so I don't feel comfortable using the one marked women, and then I have to wait for an hour before I can try going there again. There's not always a line, but we have to wait 10 minutes. We only have 10 minutes in between classes. So if the bathroom is occupied, I don't have time to wait. It's not always easy to leave during class, which means I'd simply have to wait until the end of class to use the restroom. They go into statistics about their health. They go into statistics um, regarding uh, harassment and sexual assault and the assaults are higher on women and men and non-binary um, students than on uh, gender, like students who identify with a gender. Uh, so I just would like to say that this is not only, by, not, by, by keeping these bathrooms separate but equal, um, it's not only a violation of Title IX, but it's directly affecting our students' access and success within this institution. And I truly, with my full heart, believe that this is, is contra contrary to what everyone else says, this is a pretty easy fix. It actually only entails the changing of a sign, which not a lot of people know. You think you have to put floor to ceiling stalls in because of the peaker theory, right? But that is completely debunked because that's not even true. And, 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 and we don't have to remove um, hygienic waste bins, and you don't need to remove urinals. It is simply a $40 change to every bathroom by taking down the old sign and putting up a new one. It is not drastic. It doesn't take um, bounds of, of, of money and, and, and effort. It is simply just the changing of a bathroom sign. And it is easy. So other, other than your traditional values or fear-based rhetoric, I would truly like to know what, do you, what, what, does, what does someone who is so against this feel that we have to keep segregated bathrooms in order for this institution to be organized? It, it just feels like a no-brainer. It really does. Thank you, Emily. I know you're passionate about this. Um, I don't want to go on too long. Can I say a moment here? Or Jonathan, you want to go first? You go. go. First. I, I can go? All right. Yeah, go. Um, so I want to thank President Beebe for telling us about the single cell restrooms that we have. I didn't know that information myself. Um, but I do want to say that doing that does only make us in compliance with the law. Um, and, you know, being in compliance is not the same as, you know, doing what's best. Um, you know, the law is a baseline now. You know, two years ago, if we had all these single cell gender neutral restrooms, we'd be way ahead of the game. Now we're right, you know, on, on the cusp of being average. We're doing what we need to do. We're not doing what we think is best or what's right. So that's why I think that the debate for multi cell versus single cell is important because it's now the single cell is not a debate anymore because the state has already told us that we have to do it, so it's not controversial. I know that, uh, you know, due to the Brown Act, uh, we cannot discuss the uh, proposed policy that Associated Students uh, sent to us that we got in an email from President Beebe, but I do want to say that if the Academic Senate proposed to us a policy like that, we'd probably take it really seriously and probably debate it at a board meeting. So I do want us to, perhaps at the next board meeting, uh, you know, seriously consider what they sent to us because you know, I've been on, the, on both sides. You know, I'm on the board now. I was a student at one point doing student activism. And I remember when administrators would not take the student prop proposals as seriously as the proposals of the faculty. And I think at a, you know, at a public university, we should be espousing the values of shared governance as much as possible, even if, you know, the rules don't say we exactly have to take any proposal AS makes and consider it. So I think that the fact that they went in you know, went through the formal process of writing a policy change that is something that we can, we are the main interacting body that would make a decision. I think we should give them the, you know, the respect of discussing the policy they sent to us. So I would like to see that happen uh, personally. Um, I'm, I'll save my comments about how I feel about multi-cell restrooms until then because that's not what's agendized, but I will say that I strongly support it. Thank you. Peter. It, it seems to me, well, first, it, I hope you don't, and I'm addressing the students, take 
the view that uh, we are automatically opposed to anything that you say, <laughs> because that's not the case. Uh, it seems to me we have a problem. We're on the cusp of a cultural change. That's very clear, not just locally, but nationally. Uh, and we have a problem, and we need to get together, work together, and solve it. And uh, Emily, you can be my lawyer anytime. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we shouldn't be seeing each other as antagonists on this issue. It's, it's clearly something that has a sense of, well, it's, it's sensitive, um, but we, I think we, if we work together, we can get over it, and we can find a solution that doesn't cost a trillion dollars and, and uh, allows, allows us to move forward in a, uh, a culturally sensitive fashion. Marty? Yeah. Um, I also, I agree with Emily uh, and, and have a great deal of admiration for someone who can speak like that at her age. Uh, it, I would have just about died. I would have crawled under the table a little bit um, at your age, but I think it's, it's no, really good. Yeah. I did. You had no idea. <laughs> I was a student activist, too, but I like doing the background. But, um, but I do see, I think it's important to know that uh, there are several of us up here that do understand student activism, but we also understand uh, the issue, maybe more than you think we do. My husband was a, uh, a doctor at the VA hospital. He had a number of patients, very interesting patients, trying to figure out what to do, you know. And I think the best thing that we could do I think one of the best things that we could do is to make sure that we all honor the wealth, the worth and dignity of every person. It's just that simple. It sounds simple, but that's what we need to do. And, you know, if you saw hidden figures, um, that was just crazy, you know, that there were these black women put in the basement and they didn't even have a bathroom and they're running out, you know, trying to find a bathroom. Um, and they were saving NASA at the same time, you know, that these white um, scientists were taking all the credit. So there's something, you know, there was something inherently wrong then, and there's something inherently wrong right now. And we can see that. But as Peter said, we need to all work on this together. We've been pulling for wayfa wayfinding signs for a long time here. You know, this is the way the this is the way the administration building is. Um, and we also need some for restrooms too, without a doubt. And our restrooms need to be, um, uh, they need to be more sensitive to everybody. And the best way to do it is just to have gender neutral bathrooms. I don't have a problem with that. What I do have a problem with is trying to figure out how to get there from here because we need, uh, we're gonna need some cost. There's, it's not gonna be free. I mean, I know $40 sign, I don't think is gonna do it in all, all cases, although, you know, it sort of seems like it might, but the urinals and all sorts of things might. Anyway, I think it's going to cost more than that because we need to do some um, education too. But, you know, I do think we need to talk about this on a regular uh, scheduled item, and I would be glad to do that at the next meeting, uh, Jonathan's idea there, and, and that works for me. Um, but I do want to work through this thing. I think we need to find out how many bathrooms there are, you know, what? 15 gender neutral bathrooms are a lot if you only have 20 bathrooms. But if you have 100, they're not as many. So we need to get more information, you know, as to how many bathrooms there are and how many we need. If we need two in each building, I don't know. So, so we need to do that. And what would the cost be? And then we need to get that cost into the budget. So I have some very practical steps. But 1995, when we first traveled over to Europe, I looked at these bathrooms in Denmark. I go, why don't we do this? You know, where you go, you go in there and then you come out and there's a, a multi-generational, multi-gender uh, sink. Everybody washes their hands. You know, what, what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. So that kind of thing. Um, so I think we have a lot to learn and I think we have a lot that we need to work out. And, but it all goes back to me, for me in knowing that um, the worth and dignity of every person is just really important. We need to treat everybody with dignity, which we're not doing now. End.
Marianne. Uh, first of all, I just want, what I was really trying to tell you is don't make any assumptions about who is where. Not yet. So they've already said that very well. But I also want to mention to the board that I believe, although I'm certainly willing to be corrected, that, that we need also to ask at what level and who should be making this decision. And I'm not sure a decision for the Board of Trustees to be making. Um, and that is something that we struggle with often, and often in the most important decisions, uh, who should be making the decision. And we do have to work on that before we make a decision, if we do. Okay. Thank you, Marianne. Um, Marty, I agree with you. The, the worth and importance of each individual is what strikes me about this conversation. And I haven't heard a passionate um, defense of those who feel that their privacy could be threatened here. And I think that that is part of what you're talking about is, and Peter's talking about, that you need to come together with a solution that fits everyone. We do not dismiss the concerns of some people for privacy. I spent this last weekend in Death Valley, and in the connection with that visit, I visited Manzanar. And for those of you who may not know what that is, it was the first of 10 internment camps where the U.S. government interned 10,000 Japanese, most of them American citizens, for approximately four years. And a big part, a real part, of their humiliation in that facility was the lack of privacy in the bathrooms. And that matters to people. It doesn't matter to everyone, but it matters to some. And that comes back to a respect for those people to whom it matters and a respect for solutions that make this a complex problem, make this not a simple answer. And I have to respectfully disagree with Emily. I do not think it's obvious or simple. And for that reason, I also agree with Mary Ann that at the board level, we are, in my mind, getting into a complex operational type problem. Um, and I am very concerned about doing that. Um, I think there's a lot of factors that need to be weighed um, and that we are not well equipped to make directives about those variables. Um, we look to our president and we delegate the operations of this institution to our president to make the, the difficult and complex decisions. So I'm concerned about that aspect of this particular discussion. And I'd kind of like to bring it to a close because we're now at an hour and a quarter and we haven't got into most of our agenda. So um, for that reason, I'd like to say let's move on. Anthony, did you have any? Okay. All right, we have a report from Priscilla. Good evening, Dr. Beebe, President Croninger and members of the board. Um, I feel like a breath needs to be taken. Is it only me? May I take a breath? Of course. <laughs> Thank you. So what I wanted to talk about today is um, the work of one of our subcommittees. The Academic Senate has almost a dozen subcommittees, and we mostly talk about what the Academic Senate itself is doing, but these other committees are doing really interesting and important work. So I wanted to um, feature one of them, which is the Committee for uh, 
Faculty Resources, CFR. It used to be called uh, the Committee for Teaching and Learning, and there was a big discussion about the name change, re-envisioning it, because what we really wanted to see was we have a Faculty Resources Center on campus, which is uh, available to assist faculty if they want to try out new pedagogy, new support, new instructional technology. It provides those resources to them, and we wanted our committee to be working more closely with the Faculty Resource Center to provide those connections. So that committee has been offering work the course of the year and a lot of work also with our Title III grant which is working on faculty uh, advising and mentoring and it's not the faculty who are being mentored the the faculty are working with uh, students in an advising capacity to provide support as they go through their um, programs um, but one of the things I wanted to talk about for this spring what's happening right now and I'm not sure if everybody is aware of it um, we're having a series of lectures called the Lasting Lecture Series, and it is featuring our retiring faculty. And the very first one was today at 2.30, and um, two of our faculty, and I asked their permission to mention them, so um, two of our faculty, Oscar Zavala, who is a 30-year counselor, academic counselor, <coughs> and uh, Anne-Marie Kopakin, who is a vocational nursing instructor, they gave these two lectures. and. Um, you know, the, the flyer that the committee put out, the, what they listed as the goal for these were, and it's pretty aspirational, right? Reflections on life's lessons and meaning. And I was like, wow, I'm gonna understand the meaning of life. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> um, but it was, it was a very interesting and inspiring and at moments profound uh, couple of speeches as we, we saw um, one of them was explaining a lot about her discipline and what she does in the classroom and how she views pedagogy and relates with her students. And the other one told a story about his career and how he came to his path as a way of explaining why he became a counselor and how he sees his role as a counselor. And there were, I would say, probably about 100 faculty, staff, and students there. Um, there, there were there were standing ovations for both. It was really a powerful moment. And why am I mentioning those moments of celebration? Um, I think sometimes we become mired in the minutia, which seems to expand and become greater and greater and consume our attention. And at times we need to step back from that. I'm not. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying anything in particular is minutia, but sometimes we get focused on the details. And sometimes we need the larger picture. You know, why did we become teachers? What is it we're trying to achieve as teachers? How do we relate to our students? What do we do in our classrooms? Do we still feel, feel the, the passion and desire to, to work with students in the way that they need to achieve their goals? And so to me, these lasting lecture series are a reminder to all of us who are um, working with students about, about what it all means. So the meaning of life, yes, yeah, certainly the meaning of our professional lives. And so I wanted to mention this because we have two more of these last or le lasting lecture series. Um, the next one is on April 6th, and then the last one is on April 19th. They're both at 2.30, and they're um, reminders that go out by email about that. And, and finally, I wanted to mention something. You know, this is a new thing this year, and I think it was a great idea that the Committee on Faculty Resources put together this series of talks. Um, it's very inspiring. That's something new this year, but we've been doing something for 38 years, and that is our faculty lecture. Um, that was so interesting because I have the honor of introducing the faculty lecture this year. And I went back and I read the memoir. It was quite extensive of the very first faculty lecture. And he talked about the history of it. Um, this was originated by the Academic Senate to honor uh, faculty um, who had outstanding teaching and or service to the college. This year, we're featuring um, one of our math instructors, Pam Gunther, and she's giving a talk, and this is very soon, uh, April 5th, 
um, again at 2.30, this one is in the Garvin Theater. The title of her talk is Applying Neuroscience and Non-Cognitive Research in the Classroom. And many of our faculty are involved in this area. What, what are the non-cognitive factors that can influence our students uh, retention and success in our classes. So that I think will prove to be a very interesting topic. So as we as we talk or don't talk about various things, I, I want to remind myself about what it is we're doing. And so um, I'd like occasional moments of celebration amidst the other conversations. Thank you. Questions, anyone? Okay. Thank you, Priscilla. Oh. oh. I'm sorry, I didn't see Where that. are the um, last lectures at? Um, today, you know, I should, I apologize. I don't have the room numbers for the next two. It was in the EBS building um, the, today, so I can confirm those. And uh, Elizabeth Imhoff is the co-chair of the FRC, and she sends out the reminders about that, too. Yes. Okay, cool, thank you. We did a thing like this at UCSB when I was a student. Oh, nice. And I, I loved going to them. So Very nice. This is, I'm excited. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Great idea. Okay, is Dylan here? I, ha I have his report. Oh, okay, Emily. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to read it as he emailed it to me. So, good afternoon, President Croninger, President Beebe, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity today to report on the associated students. Last month, I addressed the board in regards to Title IX after the Trump administration rescinded the Obama administration's interpretation of Title IX, the federal law that bans sex discrimination in federally funded schools. I'm so excited to report that this seed planted here a month ago has blossomed into a movement I am very proud of. Our student trustee, Emily, has actively pursued drafting a board policy to implement multi-stall gender-neutral restrooms on our campus. Our commissioner of events, David Pan Panget, C organized a free speech event at SBCC's bridge to raise awareness and build support for gender neutral restrooms. As of today, we have secured over 500 signatures and ongoing from SBCC students in support of gender neutral restrooms. Multi stall. With this momentum, the past Friday, the Student Senate voted unanimously to endorse gender neutral restrooms on our campus. The Senate believes that the potential board policy could should incorporate creating multi-stall gender neutral restrooms in each building on campus, prioritizing gender neutral restrooms in terms of accessibility to disabled students and establishing a deadline for implementation by the end of 2017. We continue to encourage the board to act on the, its commitment to the to, it, it's made to the LBGT students in Resolution 17 and to pass a board policy that will allow all students, regardless of their gender identity, to feel comfortable and safe using the rest, restrooms here at Santa Barbara City College. The ASG has also been busy with preparations for upcoming elections to elect officers for the next semester. We really want to engage the entire student body in our electoral process, so in addition to a campaign to get as many qualified candidates as possible, we're working with the channels to organize formal candidate debates next month at which the ASG candidates will debate the best way to advocate for and represent our students. Thank you so much for your time. Best, Dylan. There you go. Okay. Uh, Liz. Good afternoon, members of the board, President Beebe, President Croninger. I wanted to start out by, um, you know, we all had a power outage yesterday. And I wanted to thank Dr. Beebe for his quick and decisive decision to close the campus. And he may not realize it, but in the past, when things like this happened, classified were always still required to stay. You know, and even though this college was sometimes without power for several days, the classified still we're reporting. So I was very pleased that he was all inclusive and included everyone and not just the fa faculty and students the way it has been many times in the past. And I only know this because I've been here a long time, so it's been a while since that's happened, but I do, do appreciate the fact that he was all inclusive for everybody so staff didn't have to try to work in the dark, and <laughs> which has happened. Um, and plus with electric lines. Also, I think I was told one of the groundsmen was there when it happened and he actually s diverted traffic so that the cars would not run into the power line that was, if you saw it on the news, it was just f sparking and everything. 
We were in the middle of our meeting yesterday when we real, when we were got the emails that um, we could leave, so we continue. Luckily, the electric locks work, so we could get into the room we were going to use. Um, but we've discussed the uh, IT reorganization, which is quite extensive. So that's generated. We haven't gotten into negotiations with CSEA yet, but we have talked about that. And we spent a lot of time talking about the um, Public Records Act. We had someone come from the lawyer's office to CPC, and so I relayed that information. And everybody was really interested in getting that information about, you know, when you might have to turn over your private device. Um, and, and we also talked about the BRAC committee, which is the new uh, budget resource committee that meets for the first time tomorrow. And then I, will, I added to the agenda, being alerted that there were issues with the uh, transgender, so I put on the agenda the gender neutral bathrooms because one of the speakers talked about education. I think that's really important to start the discussion. We didn't come, there was no pro or con side, it was just the fact that it's out there, you know, it's happening and people need to have a discussion because we all work here, we all use the facilities, so you need to educate so everybody understands how it's going to work, what's going to happen. And a lot of people in the classified staff d don't know where all this single stall restrooms is. I know where a few of them are because some of them are kind of very kind of hard to find, but I think a map will really help. So I think that the discussion needs to happen and we need to work through the issues. And I don't know who will make the decision in the long run, but. I think it's an issue that needs to have a full discussion with all the parties involved, which is all of us. Mm -hmm. So I just want to let you know that, you know, we're not trying to pretend it doesn't happen. We just want, we just want to get it out there and have a full discussion about it so everybody knows and all, all the views. There are some that are for, some against, some need education to see how it would work. So I just want to let you know we were talking about it and to thank Dr. Beebe for thinking of all of us. Any questions? Okay. Just a comment. I, I, I want to join with you in, in uh, complimenting uh, Dr. Beebe in closing the campus. It's an easy thing to think, uh, do I do this? Or, yeah, maybe not. I mean, I mean, who could get hurt? And Well, no, I think he made the right call. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that no one was hurt. I mean, that, that would have been terrible had he made a different a different decision and someone would have gotten hurt. And I'm equally delighted that the uh, superintendent president is uh, aware that the safety of classified folks uh, <laughs> matters. And, uh, and I also can report that the alert system worked very well. I got phone messages, emails, text messages of all the stages. You know, that there was a problem and you shouldn't go on the bridge and you shouldn't use Loma Alta and then that the campus was closed and that the campus was opening today so from my point of view all those things worked so I, I'm very appreciative of the uh, alert systems that we, we couldn't have. have orchestrated a better test of the system that's right <laughs> <laughs> thank you I think once a firefighter always a firefighter right <laughs> <laughs> forget the dot dots PhDs it was the firefighter thing that you know <laughs> <laughs> and it's your turn yeah Anthony? I think I did want to make a comment about the, the power outage and, and uh, compliment the staff and, and uh, administration classified and how they responded to that. It was quite remarkable. I haven't had an emergency situation since I've been here, but um, <laughs> seeing how everybody responded, how Luce responded and took control of uh, messaging and everybody just kind of fell right into place. Dr. Jarrell was there. and and uh, Lindsay and, and all. We had, uh, I think, a really good team. And it was a great, grand, grand opportunity for us to be able to explore um, things in terms of how we respond to an emergency. And we were thinking much broader than just what was happening at that particular moment. We were thinking about how we can improve things, um, which we always do. Um, and so I was very pleased with all of it. I also wanted to report that I had a chance to visit the Santa Barbara Unified School District board meeting and uh, made some comments there. Um, was very well received, um, very impressed with the board there, and, and I know that they're looking forward to a, to a joint board meeting at some point in the future. Um, but I was most impressed with what happened after 
I made my presentation talking about the promise and so on um, with members of the audience, parents that were there and how they met me outside, probably a half a dozen, eight of them, and talked about how much they have respect for the college here and, and how they're looking forward to their children coming to the college to be successful and, and participate in the Promise program. So I was really pleased with that. And then finally, I, I had a chance to attend, along with one over a thousand uh, kids and, and other individuals, the Science Discovery Day that we had um, at the college. I, I think some of you attended as well. Um, what a fantastic event. And the faculty really um, gave some <laughs> phenomenal presentations and really grabbed the interest of so many children. I could see little lights going on and, and uh, excitement happening with those kids. And, and so I just, I was down there playing with, with goo and all kinds of things that was going on. And it was just, it was fun to do with the, with the children. And I can see that we're going to have, uh, to doc, Dr. Jarrell, we're going to have lots of uh, future students that are going to be science majors. Mm -hmm. yeah, I know he's excited about that. Mm -hmm. So that's my report. Okay. Thank you. Uh, board members report, um, just taking the representatives in order, and that's not to exclude any other topics uh, that you may want to report on, but uh, legislative? So I don't have anything new to report. It's been a very busy month for me. Um, I do know that a lot of bills are being voted on this week and next in the legislature, so by the next meeting, uh, we'll have a more complete view of where various bills are going. I will say that um, I have been in contact with individuals at the Reclaim Higher Education Coalition, which our, uh, some, I think one of our unions is a part of, uh, CSCA, uh, but they uh, have been creating a proposal on how to eliminate tuition in California completely at every level, UC, CSU, and, U and CC. It would cost only $400 million to eliminate all tuition at CC's total, at all of them. It's really not that much money when you think about the overall benefit. So I've I just been in contact with them, and they've been uh, sharing a lot of information that they've been doing research. Uh, it's the UC Faculty Association which has done um, most of the research. Uh, but it's, it's very promising work. So I'll talk more about it at a future meeting. Um, while we're on this topic, one of the things that uh, we had talked about earlier is developing job descriptions. And so what I was thinking was that our various reps could start a process of drafting kind of their job descriptions and you would certainly be one of them and then we could bring them back to the board for discussion. It is on my to-do list, I have to yes. do it, yeah. Okay. K-12. So in anticipating our joint board meeting with Santa Barbara Unified, um, well we are, now second term, well, Jonathan, first term, but you, you're a good researcher, so you can go back and look at the previous packets. We're looking at budgets, and the Unified School District is looking at budgets, which actually creates an opportunity for people to work even closer and collaboratively and be more creative. And so the thought was, and what you guys think is, I think, yes, we benefit from presentations and things like that, which have has been what we've done in the past, how we structured our agenda. And certainly it was needed. We were starting a relationship. We never had really met with the unified school districts and talk about just common interests and learning more about each other. But in light of the promise, um, I think it's worth talking about what are our priorities? Where can Santa Barbara City College have the biggest impact with Santa Barbara Unified and vice versa? Um, we have we had a number of initiatives and we had the get focus. We actually, we still have the freshman seminar in our high schools. Um, and I don't know if maybe that's something that, you know, Marianne, our dual enrollment coordinators are amazing. And, and I, I've seen them, you know, and incidentally just at different events, but maybe if we could get an update as to where we're at with that um, and seeing what that looks like now in our high schools, because now they have academies. And so now the freshmen, that course is taking on a new form because of, Vada and, and the Apple Academy and the Engineering Academy. And um, I think the thinking is that we would have more of a conversation on fewer items versus a series of presentations. And I don't know what you guys feel about that, but you know, you get th that many people together in one room, I feel like we should act 
done something and move forward with things. Um, and, and as board members, I mean, I think that if we do send literature to the Santa Barbara Unified Board and vice versa, and we have to do our due diligence, we get board packets, we have to study them. Um, we have what's been on our, what's have, our previous meetings are online. Angie has archived everything for us. Uh, so I think that, Marsha, as you work with Dr. Beebe to set that agenda, um, either if Dr. Beebe would set up a time where maybe Marianne and I can meet and with our dual enrollment coordinators and maybe see what's going on in that end, and then we can kind of connect and just draft an agenda that's going to help us get some depth versus just stuff. What do you guys and, think? And I would suggest that you be involved in working through that agenda. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's it's a wonderful idea. I really do. I think, you know, if there were a time, now's it. And we need to have some substance in, in this, this conversation. Um, new superintendent here, new superintendent there. Um, we've had, he and I have had, Mr. Matsuokas and I have had some great conversations in and uh, I think the board members are, a couple of board members are new there and would really enjoy having a conversation at a, at a level that we're talking about here. So I think it'd be good. It might be, I mean, I, I agree completely. Fewer items, uh, greater depth. But I'd also like to couple it with an informal time where trustees mm -hmm. from both sides can, can mingle and find out a little bit about each other and about what they feel strongly about, um, whether, whether that issue has to do with Santa Barbara City College and the, the transition to the college or with their own uh, issues related to finance or whatever. Somebody mm -hmm. playing something? Huh. Oops, yeah, they were. Um, well, that, that does it for my train of thought. I, <laughs> <laughs> but I think I got the, the core of what I had in mind. Out. It's a new phone. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Okay, SBCC Foundation. And we haven't met since the last, but they have a wonderful board uh, orientation for all the board members that Marianne went through, and I'll go through it again. And I think as we rotate through this job, it's going to be great that we get just more involved and knowledgeable on the foundation end of it. And then... Maybe when we get off this board, we'll join their board. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a plan. <clears throat> um, the mitigation ad hoc committee, we met uh, with Janet Wolf, a county supervisor, and I think that was a good meeting. Um, I think probably the biggest takeaway there is the importance of continuing communication, and I know Anthony is committed to that. Uh, was some feeling of being left out earlier, and we have to remember to be sure and keep our supervisors informed and our other elected folk as, as their districts are impacted. Um, we have a meeting April 27th with uh, Supervisor Hartman, and we also have a meeting coming up tomorrow of just our group to kind of uh, begin, I think, to formulate some of our recommendations back to the board. So that's the schedule there. Uh, the community partnership group. Well, the community, the, the ad hoc committee was developed so as to provide a, uh, a charge to a committee that has yet to be formed. And so uh, we, have, we have done that, and I have a draft of, of uh, that to share with you. Thank you. And um, since since I don't have enough copies for everybody, let me let me read it. It's very it's very brief. Yes. Um, the charge of the community partnership committee is to explore how the college might engage our community in a proactive way, so as to minimize confusion and misunderstanding, and enhance ways to establish partnerships with those who make this community their home. To this end, we propose the formation of a committee of the board that will do three, three things. I use bullets, so <laughs> Marty's going to be so happy. I think you're wonderful. <laughs> um, be sensitive to the concerns of the community as expressed in the media outlets, public forums, and other means 
to ensure that those concerns are brought to the attention of the superintendent president and this board. Uh, secondly, identify the partnerships between City College and the Greater Santa Barbara community that are both appropriate and mutually beneficial. And finally, recommend ways that the community can provide input to our decision-making process accompanied by the assurance that we will take that input seriously. Well, thank you, Peter. That sounds like a, a really good draft. And my suggestion would be we notice it next time around for discussion and go forward with the, with the uh, next steps. Whatever. Sure. I just want to make a correction to a statement I said earlier. It wasn't CSEA that is the union that of ours that's uh, involved in the plan to eliminate tuition. It is California Community Colleges Independence, which Cornelia is the treasurer of, and the Faculty Association of California Community Colleges. That's those two, not CSEA. Oh, okay. I wanted okay. to clarify. Okay. Um, other topics, anyone want to report on other topics? Okay, we'll move on to developing the consent agenda. This is where we group items. Uh, today it would cover 7.1 through 9.8, human resources, educational programs, and business services, not the resolutions part of that, but the other items. And the initial question becomes, is there anything uh, in addition to the materials we have before us and the familiarity we have with what these items represent uh, that would cause anyone to want to pull out an item uh, for separate consideration? Jonathan. Uh, student health fee. Okay. So that is, which item is that? Do you know the number? Eight four. Eight, eight, four. Eight, eight, four. eight four. Okay. So we'll do, we'll pull eight four. Anything else? Peter. Three, uh, the uh, discussion of, uh, well, I, I have just a brief question about records reclassification and destruction. And, and maybe we should pull that or we I can, can ask the we question. We can pull it, it's, hmm? it's fine. Okay. Anything else? Okay, then may I have a motion to approve Item 7.1 through 9.8, excluding 8.4, 8.3 and 8.4. I so move. Okay, Marianne. Jonathan seconds. Um, any comments, questions? All in favor? Wait, before, before you vote. <laughs> it's me. Yes. <laughs> I think we were gonna remove an item on uh, personnel. Were we? Yeah, um, related to the vice president for business services mm -hmm. position. Can yeah, we had that. that. It's actually, um, uh, a, I guess it would be a it deletion. It was to be announced, but we're going to delete it. Yeah, we're going to delete that particular item. We don't have a vice president for business services person to announce, and that's we were just putting it as a placeholder. So okay. we'll pull that so out. So I, I don't think we need to pull it out so much as know that it's, it's been it. edited right. okay. and deleted. Good. Okay. With that, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, let's go to 8.3. Peter, your question. Um, as I read the proposal, uh, student records from as, as late as, what, well, just five or six years ago would be destroyed. Does that mean that a student who graduated that long time ago would not be able to access records or have transcripts sent to another institution? No, we're, I don't know if Dr. Jarrell wants to talk about this. Wait, don't yeah, the, permanent. yeah. So you, what are we destroying? You have to talk up here, Paul, <laughs> <laughs> so we can get it recorded. This might have been records that pertain to a, a particular grade, a spreadsheet that someone turned in, something that was specific about a particular uh, a petition that a, a student uh, submitted. All of those are, are the ones that we're required to keep, but then we can declassify those. Anything that relates to their permanent record from the standpoint of their transcript and grades that they received in the class, we keep, so they have access to those. Okay. That? Mm -hmm. 
that takes care of it for me. You might want to stay up here and talk about 8.4. Yeah, you, we might as well. Oh, Laura, we've got Laura here. Okay. Okay. Good, okay. <laughs> might as well do both of them, and then we can vote together. Laura Ferris, thank you for being here. Appreciate that. Jonathan, did you? I'm Laura Ferris. I'm the Director of Student Health and Wellness at Santa Barbara City College. And I'm very happy to be here to speak on behalf of the wonderful services that we provide. Our funding is from the student health fee. And that fee is set, the cap is set by the chancellor's office. And when it's sort of like a cost of living raise, when the cost of services that we do, our salaries, our medical supplies, all those things, when that is, goes high enough, the chancellor will say, you can raise the student health fee a dollar. We're now at $19 a semester, I'm at, and asking for 20, and the chancellor's office has um, proposed that. We were sort of behind in summer tuition, and we haven't raised that since 2008. I'm ha I was happy to present at the Student Senate about a week and a half ago, and I'd love to do the same presentation here sometime about our services. I love data. I have lots of great data. <laughs> and um, they supported the raise. They voted last Friday and supported it, and also had a wonderful, um, the, the channels came out in support of the increase in the fee. So I'm here to be a part of this democratic process and to say how proud I am of the mental health services we provide. Um, just one little bit of data that I think is pretty amazing is I belong to a statewide um, group of the California Community College's health services and we do a survey every year and the average California Community College provides 440 individual mental health counseling um, uh, uh, sessions a year, and we provide 2,000. So we're, we're really at the peak of, of the game, and so I'm just here to, to be proud of my staff and my services and ask you to support this fee increase. Thank you, Laura. I think we had a specific question about it. John. Yeah, oh yeah, my question's not about the fee. Um, it's about the second part of the proposal that says that the fee will increase automatically oh, okay. uh, whenever the maximum mm -hmm. is raised. So I was just, me personally, I think the board should just be, even if we're going to do it, I think it should just still come to a vote just for transparency reasons and, you know, the democratic process. So that's, I think the fee increase is fine. I just have a problem with uh, making it automatic. I I think other community colleges, I don't have that data, but I think it's about half have an automatic fee raise, and that's because it's cost of living. It's just what it costs to provide salaries and medical supplies and all those things is constantly going up, and so it's not really an increase of I'm going to, the program's going to get more money, it's just that we can provide the same services and not fall behind. And those numbers are on our website when students look at what they will need to pay to come? It's, it's on the, the SBCC website, yes. I'm not, I'm not contending that the money is for a bad reason. I, like Process-wise, I just think that a vote is important compared to an automatic, you know, mm -hmm. just for transparency's sake. I, I, I feel you, I, like, I agree. I think the board is always gonna make the right decision of approving the increase. I just, just having it out here like this is just helpful for the public and for us to know that it's happening. Mm -hmm. So that's just my opinion on process, not on content. Um, just for the sake of asking the question, not because I'm overly concerned, but what would, if we, if we didn't approve this, would you guys go on the red next year? Well, that's, we, dep we're, I'm nervous because of falling, uh, falling numbers of students. Just for example, uh, 1,600 
fewer students from fall to this semester. That's about $30,000 in my program. And that is what I pay a bilingual um, mental health counselor in a, in a year. So it directly, every dollar directly impacts services. Okay, well we did have a number of years recently where, where the student body kept increasing. Mm -hmm. and, and the student body doesn't, not always is gonna stay the same. There's gonna be ups and downs right. and, and we're searching for the right size here. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't like to do this automatically. Um, do you normally project like do you, you have a base amount like this this is what we need to just keep the doors open and get provide basic services and well I am because we I may not have that yeah. money yeah in I'm future. in constant um, dialogue with Lindsay <laughs> because I'm not a I depend on her to help me with my budget and I've met with her twice this semester all already so nobody knows what enrollment is going to do and I'm I have one position that someone's retiring and I'm I've shifted my um, my staff around a little so mm -hmm. I'm not rehiring one position because I want to maintain the level of services that this college is used to and that the students deserve yeah so um, I guess what I was getting at is, you know, in business we always have you have fixed fixed costs just to keep the doors open. The, you know, like and, the rest of the college, the cost. main costs are are human resources. Those um, salaries and benefits um, of the permanent staff are permanent, and so I have to be, you know, kind of agile and look at hourly workers, student workers. Um, I have a fabulous um, uh, spa position that's running our SBC Wellness Connection, and she's out, out there getting a lot of grants and doing amazing things in the community. So okay. we're looking at all those things. Veronica. Yeah, I appreciate your point, Jonathan. I, I think we're all on the same team, and so I, I'm comfortable as it's written because I, I think that school health offices are the entry point to the larger healthcare system. And so $20 for our students to get whatever service they need from the mental health, which has become so much more important mm -hmm. than physical, well both, but it just, the, the rising cases of mental health. Um, I do trust Lindsay. I, I think that if you need this to plan and to move this department forward so that our students have this door open all the time, I'm okay with that. And I trust that if this was gonna be an issue that it would come back or we don't need this. I mean, I know people don't decrease fees, but I do think we're on the same team. I do think that I, even the fact that you said you work with her, in my head I was like, well, she's probably working with Lindsay who's overseeing all this stuff. So, I, Jonathan, I think I'm comfortable, I would be okay doing this because I trust that you're not a for-profit um, <laughs> clinic <laughs> and that you're not the CEO trying to, you know, uh, get your triple digit six figure salary. You're, you're here for our students. And, and so I really would like to come back and present data to you and information on the services if that's something that the board would be interested in. Yeah. Great. Well, you know, I, in terms of Jonathan's uh, suggestion, I do think it's important that we have an opportunity, you all have an opportunity to see what the, the fees are, be reminded of what the increase is, rather than it just be automatic without anybody ever kind of revisiting that. I think that's a really important transparency aspect to it. The, there is a planning aspect to this, though, that I, I'd like to make sure that we're also aware of, and that is in terms of uh, Laura's budget and being able to project into the future, and we're trying to move in the direction of multi-year planning with our with our budget and all. Um, you know, maybe some common ground here would be that we continue to revisit this um, each year, uh, even though that there's an automatic provision in this, so that we at least can stay in touch with with whatever it is that's happening with the particular health fees. Uh, I would be I'd be, I'd be concerned that if we have something that's just automatic and, and we're not in touch with it or, or close to it, that we could, uh, you know, just not, just not really know what's going on with it. We lose the transparency with that. 
the, the, the increases that we're talking about, these are incremental and they are uh, uh, same, the same sort that we're talking about. Tonight. Yeah, tonight. it's one the exact same time we're talking about is the chancellor's office saying, saying you go, you go by dollar, dollar, you can, and, 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 it's and it's always one dollar. Okay. Okay. That's, it's that's always fine. one dollar. Yeah, that's yeah. Fine. yeah. That's, fine. that's fine. And I think, and I think, I think, I think, I think Jennifer, and your, your, objections your objections take care of by the fact that it's going to be, it's going to be revealed to us on a basis. basis. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever, mm -hmm. whenever it happens, mm -hmm. we get, we get to know. And it doesn't, doesn't happen every year. It's just, just when, when they, they there's, some, there's some economic, economic index, index, maybe, you know, know the names, the names, it's, it's in there. there. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 it has a later, later index or something. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so. Place, 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 you know, later, 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 Perhaps in this area that we, we add, add, add four, four to eight point point four, which four, basically which says that the superintendent president 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 was one of the board annual annual increases or something like that. Like that. Would that? Would that? Yeah, I know. I know. I'm trying to get in the middle here. I like that. Like that. Is that okay? Okay. 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 Are you okay? Are you okay, Peter? I. I. Well, that's up to the other side. But I think I think I am. Uh, that's important, that's Andy. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we did. <laughs> okay. Um, so now we're in business service action items 10.1, resolution number 24, budget transfer between major objects. Um, and uh, it, that's a resolution, so Andy gets to ask each of us. I need a motion first. Jonathan, motion. Uh, second, Craig. Angie? Trustee Haslund? Aye. Trustee Kugler? Aye. Trustee Abood? Aye. Trustee Gallardo? Aye. Trustee Bloom? Aye. Trustee Nielsen? Aye. Trustee Croninger? Aye. Student Trustee Grady? Uh, that takes us to 11.1, .1, the balloting for the 2017 election of candidates for California Community College Trustees Board of Directors. And process-wise, I went through this with Angie so we can try to do things the same way uh, from year to year. <laughs> and <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to see if Anthony has any comments. We're going to talk among ourselves about whether board members have any comments. This is all before we have any motions. Uh, we, each of us will give Angie your nine numerical, and there's a list in the front there where each person has a number. She doesn't want the name, she wants the number next to their name. Angie will keep track of those numerical choices from each of us. She will add them up, and then the people who get the highest number of choices, we will have our motion and approval of that slate. So first off, Anthony. I know a lot of people, but I don't know any of these. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, go I'm gonna leave, uh, leave it at that. Okay, uh, board members, do you have any comments on the group here? Yeah. Jonathan. I have just one, I, I know only one person on this list, um, her, but her name's Marissa Perez. I've met her at uh, the different conferences that I've been to. She is a very, very intelligent person. Um, she's a young woman of color, and she's been not just involved in her board, but in a wide variety of other organizations that I think will be good for her to be on the CCCT board. Like, for example, she's on the uh, National Association for Latino Elected Officials board, too. So 
I think that'll be a good person to have on both. Thank you. That was helpful. Uh, Marty? I have two that I know on here. Uh, Stephen Bloom, although he pronounces his name wrong, Blum, but we'll just go by <laughs> move on there. But he and I have worked together with the uh, Teachers Association for years now. And uh, he's just, he has a lot of energy um, and he certainly knows education. And I, I, you know, he's been on this board. He's an incumbent, but I, I think he's a really good person. And then the second one is uh, Jim Moreno used to live in Santa Barbara. I know him. Um, I don't always agree with him, but he's one of those people that I like to talk to about that, you know, because he's very agreeable and a good person, and, and um, I don't need somebody that I agree with all the time on there, so. But he knows Santa Barbara, he knows this area, even though he's now, I think he's up north somewhere. I've forgotten where now, maybe up in Stockton or something, but it says coast, so I'm not quite sure where he lives, but it doesn't really matter, he knows Santa Barbara, so that's good. Okay. Jonathan? I want to second Jim. He's actually been one of the trustees at the conferences who like has gotten to know me and like was the first person who talked to me when I first oh, yeah. went. So that was good. You know I think he's a good yeah, guy. I do. Okay. I agree with you guys on you. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're not voting yet. We're just talking no, about who we know or what insights yeah, we may have. I, th I think Craig knows him too. <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just didn't want people to think we were voting. Um, Peter, no, we're not. Peter, no, had I you raised that. your <laughs> hand for comments? Yeah, uh, but Marty already mentioned Steve uh, Bloom or Plum. Um, Steve has been, he was very instrumental in moving that, the, the Triple CT board uh, to focus on accreditation. And um, oh, he right. had uh, enormous insight, which is another way of saying he agreed with me. And, uh, <laughs> um, and I would certainly, uh, uh, step out of my way to be supportive of his yeah. candidacy. It's also interesting to note that uh, several of the candidates running for re-election are candidates <coughs> that we supported three years ago. Um, among those were Laura Cassis, mm -hmm. Steve Castellanos, and uh, Pam Hayes, Haynes. Um, they are back on the list, and there may be others. I'm, I haven't quite gotten through this. But I don't see, oh yes, uh, um, Adrian Gray is also on our list from uh, uh, three years ago. I'm impressed that you either remember or you found your list somewhere in your no, man cave. I, uh, which no, we, Marty, we gave it Marty, I gave cheated. It out. I you cheated. cheated. I, I wrote an email to Angie who oh, found it. Oh, that's how you find this. <laughs> yeah, that's um, good. Yeah, it's in your <coughs> folder. Angie put it in our folder so we would know because I well, mean, there's a certain quite. element of what well, we liked you last time, what happened. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that that list was last that year's list. Yeah. This is three years this ago. This is three years ago, okay. Yeah, Which you're right, because be there's a term uh, element. Exactly. Yeah. So we have uh, one, two, three, four, five people who we voted for three years ago um, that I would I would uh, anticipate that we would want to support again. Do you want to repeat who those were? Well, the, f the five people on my list are uh, Adrian Gray, uh, Stephen Blum, Laura Cassis, uh, Stephen Castellanos, uh, and Pam Haynes. Can we give up of Lauren Steck? Didn't we? We did last year. I don't last know year why we he's up. For her. Uh, yeah. Oh, actually, I do know why because he's not an incumbent. So we did support, yeah. and I believe, at least in part, that had to do with the similarity of the issues that Monterey faces mm -hmm. that we face yeah. um, as as a college, you know, a coastal town and relatively similar sizes. So, um, and there are a lot of factors here in terms of trying to achieve balance in viewpoint, balance in college size, mm -hmm. and balance in <coughs> what looks like people have issues that we're interested in. So I, I did have a question on timing. I mean, is it essential that we vote today? Um, I understood that this was due in uh, mid-April. Between March 10 and April 25th. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Is it a problem? Well, I would, I would like to have a little more time to read the, the documentation 
that represents each individual. Uh, I'm, I don't feel I've given it sufficient time. But I, I mean, I, I'll go along with the majority. If, if today is it. Um, well, they tally the ballots at the annual trustee conference only because somehow I got doing it the last couple of times someone called from Sacramento, remember me, I met you at a conference, can you tell me these things? And so Jonathan, be careful who you're going around talking to. <laughs> you're going to end up in some room tallying a thousand sheets. Um, but so is there a time thing with, because they have to, they well, tally you could Well, you could postpone it till um, okay, April, we have one April 13th, we have one. yeah. But you can't postpone it till then. April yeah, 27th. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. right. No, yeah. I saw that. Yeah. This is this is I think about when we have traditionally done it. This is the, traditionally this is when our... it's been done, but if you want to move it to April, that's up to you. Jonathan. I'm okay with moving it to the next meeting so Peter has more time. Is everybody else ready in in which case I don't want to hold anything up. If you're ready, let's do it. If you are like me needing a little more time, let's postpone it. <laughs> Oh, it's a labor of love. If anybody's willing to do their school term plus the triple C cheat term again, I mean, it's yeah. nonpartisan public service. You got to love community colleges to do this gig. And I think these folks do. I mean, these names, I recognize them because I tallied every single thing and I recognize the names. Um, I, I, I hope that this Lauren Steck gal gets in because mm -hmm. she's in Monterey. It's like in the middle. And so you have a lot of like Southern Cal and NorCal, and so it's just like if we have 112 colleges, the way I looked at it was let's distribute the geography is kind of what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. but, but I'm okay either way, Peter. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, while we're talking about people, I would mention that I think some of us met Michelle Jenkins. I know I met her twice, once at yeah. CCLC and once when we went over to for the Carver training over at uh, Santa Clarita. Mm -hmm. Right. And she was pr she's president of the board and she was very knowledgeable, mm -hmm. very um, uh, great fun to talk to about, you know, board issues. So I would be very positive on her. Adrian Gray, I met once when um, I went up, uh, she was someone we met with when we were checking um, references and visiting the campus with Lori. So I don't know. I mean, I'm ready, but I, I'm not wedded. Others? <laughs> I don't know if we, you can ever get totally ready for this. You could pick out a couple people that you know or that mm -hmm. you're really familiar with mm -hmm. they, where they stand. But, you know, it's almost like you, you, do, your, you do the best you can. And uh, I read the statements, and I reread them again this afternoon before I got here. I, I, don't, I, I don't mind delaying. We're going to have to do this. If not now, we got to do it in a couple of weeks. So it's, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, I move to table until next meeting this decision. I'll second that. OK. OK. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Emily. Do I get a vote on this? I think so. It does hey. mention Sandra C. Well, it doesn't mention I think it's the, like the other ones. It's just like everything sense. else. Yeah, it's, it's advisory. It's, it's an advisory uh, okay. vote. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's an advisory vote. I didn't know if I... Yeah, I think... Should I don't think question, because yeah. if you don't ask, you don't know. But you certainly can comment if there's someone you know or have information about that you think we should know. No. Nope, not. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we have Jonathan's motion to put it off next time. I will say we're going to have to try to be fairly efficient, not that we haven't been running pretty long today, but um, we'll have stuff to do next time too. So um, let's be ready to go and do it efficiently. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. It will reappear. Okay. And you'll have another thick packet. <laughs> and Peter, don't say we don't do anything for you. <laughs> I, I appreciate that so much, Marsha. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we have covered 12.1, um, budget development timeline. Uh, Anthony and I had a discussion about this timeline, which is your last piece of paper. Um, it's adapted from the one last year, I believe, but we used to have our fiscal committee looking at the budget at certain points. 
And um, what <coughs> we agreed on was moving up a couple of dates for the board to see uh, revenue and expenses earlier in the tentative budget. So we moved that one up to April 27th, which was formerly May 11th. Um, so we'll have a, a sooner to, to look at the kind of base, the basics of how it's looking. Um, and we also went to August 10th, which is earlier again, for <laughs> seeing how the final budget is. Now, usually that doesn't change as much, but um, who knows, there may be issues. And we are um, looking at, for the first time, really doing more long-range planning in the budget here, so there'll be more to talk about in that regard. Uh, and Lindsay is nodding happily, <laughs> <laughs> or not so happily. <laughs> May Anthony. I com comment? Yeah. Um, my concern was I, I just and and it worked out that uh, we have proper time to be able to present to CPC and and uh, the internal college mm -hmm. campus before we bring it to you all. And this works out that way. So yeah. uh, I'd be in favor of of this. Yeah. CPC sees it first still in all cases. So um, it yeah. seemed to work. The schedule seemed to work fine. I have a question. Uh, the, so the, it's the, it's the August 24th item that's being moved to the August 10th? Let me check. Okay. Yes. Okay, and then it's the May 11th that's being moved to April 27th? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then, but we have those meetings anyway. It's right, just no, when oh, no, we will see. When we'll see, yeah. No, I, I just wanted to make sure so I knew yeah. in my head uh, when it was. Yeah. Um, my other question is... Uh, for the forums, do they have to be during finals week? <laughs> it doesn't sound so mm. good, does it? Lindsay is, Lindsay's indicating no. Because it says two dates during week of finals. So I, it seems like it might, you know, this budget, I don't want to say controversial, but it might be a lot in it based on what we've been learning at our meetings. So maybe one not during finals week so students can fully participate if they wanted to. And the rest of the campus. And the rest of the campus, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're getting indication that there's no problem changing that. Um, any pr proposed date? Okay. Oh, a proposed date? No, I don't, I don't know what's best. I what's think you best, guys have to decide which way to Probably. move it because yeah. of the work that you need to do to yeah. put it together. So we can work on that yeah. and figure that out and make sure it's not conflicting with anything. Good. Yeah, they have to be ready. So it could be that... Yeah. That's hard to do any sooner. I don't know. We'll look into that for you. Your issue. Yeah. Well, and Marsha, I mean, I appreciate, you know, getting things earlier too, but I also know, I mean, I don't think Lindsay has the staff of, of I don't know. And so I just want to make sure too that you guys feel comfortable saying no. Like, I know you're intelligent and she whips things out so eloquently, but people shouldn't always operate on the I'm whipping things out every day of my job. And so I hope that Dr. Beebe, you feel comfortable saying to us, no, thank well, we'll you for you know. like, thank you for requesting this, but like, we can't do it. And so I just hope that you know that we we're always going to request it because that's what we want to do. We want information, want to get it done, but that we're not in your offices. And we, I know you guys and my colleagues here don't expect you guys to be operating at a, oh my gosh, we have to get this done. Cause that's not humanly kind. Well, I th think what we deliberately did was piece sees the same thing. So I, I didn't anticipate any additional workload. Is that right? I appreciate your conscientiousness. Um, but I think these dates really do fit into our normal operations. So I don't think it's going to be any kind of a stretch. And Lindsay would definitely be telling me if it was. Huh? <laughs> Not thrilled, but we'll do it. OK, so now she's backing up a little bit. <laughs> so She's, are you good with this then? I mean, it's gonna be okay? If it's, if it's a major problem, I mean, we'll come back. Yeah, I mean, we'll look at it in detail. Take a moment well, to think about it because we really want you to be thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> it's 6.15. I think Peter took a happy pill. Today. Yeah, I did. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, items for future board consideration. Jonathan. Do we have um, any movement on the meeting with AS? Um, Angie, have we figured out a date? Uh, no, we don't have a date yet. We, we're working on it. Okay. okay. 
And the other the other one we don't have a date with is um, I think you wanted to meet with the student senate also. Oh, that's what I meant. That's oh, AS. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> AS. I said <laughs> academic senate. Yeah. Right. Well, we mind. had a What's date up with that. <laughs> we had a date with academic senate, but now academic senate wants to move it, and we haven't got the new date. Right. So right. you can take the twelfth okay. off of your calendar yes. for the moment. Yes. <laughs> Um, that, that looks like that one's not working. Um, and uh, the joint meeting with the uh, school districts as well. We should I think be we're looking at, at May. Okay. Yeah, we have to look While at we're May. we're talking dates. Okay. Um, another one is I'm really interested in the policy on policies. So um, right. if we don't have to talk about it next week because we probably have a lot next week but um, or next, next time, but <coughs> I don't since we don't have a policy on policies, how to get that started? Should should I could write a policy and maybe just draft something up for to go off of and change or starting point? Yeah. I think what I was thinking was that there's probably based on Marty and I having been through all of these, <laughs> uh, my recollection is there are pieces in different places and good, that yeah. the effort for this particular one would be to find those pieces and put them in one place or at least reference cross reference and so um it's wow. probably harder for you to bring a draft on that one than it is for me but it was definitely the thought was there's a draft to work on for everyone to discuss and bring it to the board and to give it a higher priority sounds fine i mean i i think we've got a few of them here we need to do so, um, let's see. I have, um, oh, I have uh, thinking of adding here the job descriptions we talked about earlier today for our different folk. Um, you and I talked about a budget update, a broad budget update thing, mm -hmm. which probably will be next time since we haven't talked much budget since the retreat. <laughs> and um, I noted an offer to hear about our health services, student health services. So, I guess so I'm speaking so much during this item. Um, the policies we discussed at the retreat, do we, I'm not, I don't think we should do it anytime soon necessarily, but do we have a timeline and when we can expect to be voting on those just so I can mentally think about it? Like it's May? Probably June? toward the end of the year. Toward the end of the year, we've. Revive, we've got some drafts, and I've sent those around um, and received some feedback, and so now it needs to go back out. Yeah, what I'm thinking, not the end of the calendar year, but more the end of the maybe right. fiscal academic year. Right, right, right. Okay, yeah, okay, academic cool. year. And, and maybe in long, terms of long-range planning, the other thing we talked about was FICMAT coming back in the mm -hmm. fall um, to give us their review and how we're doing. Well, they're wanting a, FICMAN is wanting a follow-up uh, in terms of where we are with budget um, and uh, kind of what our priorities are, how we're going to deal with the remaining four and a half million. Well, I haven't seen the first four <laughs> <laughs> either. <laughs> so, yeah. There you go. But you're right. <coughs> so, um, so that's what I have. Uh, oh, Emily, I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, I would like to add maybe the reading of the board policy that the ASG has uh, sent on to us regarding gender neutral um, restrooms on campus. I think if we could have that as discussion, uh, potential action item. I'm okay with discussion, though we seem to have had quite a bit. Um, but. Uh, I'm not sure yet whether it should be a board level policy. So let's have, let's break that into pieces if we're gonna go it with is. that. Um, Priscilla, you had something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trying not to slow things down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to mention that we have a process for the development of any board policies and we have a committee, BPAP, which looks at them, it goes to all governance groups. So for a policy to come from one group directly to the board would be highly unusual and out of our normal procedure. Well, you're right, Priscilla, and I'm glad you reminded us of that. Thank you. Because, um, I mean, the, one, the policies that the board talked about and developed in draft from the retreat related to fiscal matters, which will go to BPAP and will go through that <coughs> process, um, 
but it does make sense for that kind of policy. I mean, from my perspective, there's money involved here, there's priorities, there's choices, so you know, all the usual groups should, should have some input, and I think that's what we talked about today, was so, that there's a broad spectrum of viewpoints and input. So what does Emily do with that uh, board policy draft? Does she give it to... Um, uh, Priscilla, do you want to run through the or steps? You're the you're uh, you the don't have to run through all of it, but where does Pat. it go next so she knows? <laughs> That's all. Pat is uh, an expert on. as well. <laughs> Sorry, Kinsey. So Pat is the lead of BPAP, so she would bring it to the BPAP committee, and the governance groups would decide if it needs to go for more extensive discussion to each of those groups. If it does, then it comes back to BPAP with the feedback. So it's either a single step or a multi-step process depending, and I'm guessing this is multi-step. Okay. Okay. And it might be part of the education that we were talking about, so that works. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I, Thank you. I just want to say, I don't know that we're at the policy level yet, because I don't think that what Liz mentioned has happened yet. The conversations, the talking, the, the fact that we serve a district from Carpinteria all the way to Gaviota. I don't know how we can talk about a policy, because you would think that you would shape a policy based on what your community input is and so I don't know that the classified staff has had time to talk that that anybody on campus has had time to talk about any of this stuff that our students had had the time for everybody to have these conversations which I think is really important yeah. no it's it's a good point um, I think that what Priscilla was describing provides for that <laughs> some of that conversation though not the community aspect of it and and that's a good point um, but it reminds me that I also have this concern about whether it's a board level policy. Um, and so that sort of feeds into the whole question. I'd hate to have everybody work up a policy and then we decide it's not, it, it's too micromanaging. It's too involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the college. It's just to be fair so that everybody can, you know, I, I guess I think of that incident that was on campus, the, the TP. Uh, that, that was like a, you know, when we learned about that and um, that was, I mean, we learned about it through email and we didn't get involved and Dr. Gaskin did a great job with everybody taking care of it. But the fact that as trustees, we were learning of such a emotional, very sensitive subject through the lens of the media and just through the emails we got, you know, that part of it is, it's, we don't want that. We want everybody to have conversations that are respectful, that are knowledgeable, and um, and that honor the district, which is Carpinteria all the way through Gaviota, and it's, it's a, right. a, a wider audience than comes to our campus here. And yeah, and it shouldn't be a surprise to that to our community. Yeah, I I need a lot more feedback from different groups in different segments, and then I got to think hard about. Uh, uh, you know, if we have to do a policy on this, if that becomes apparent, and I, I agree with you, Marcia, so far that I think it's got to us way prematurely, although we do need to be aware. I, um, I'm thinking about, you know, my actual district within the district, the area that I represent, you know, and um, I don't know all of them, but I know, I know quite a few people in my neighborhoods, and, um, you know, they're, they're the, the opinions are not what I heard today. I'm not saying what my opinion is, because my responsibility is not just to that area, to, to those constituents, it's to these students and to this institution, mostly the students and the people that are paying the bills. So I, you know, I think there's a lot more sides to this issue that, that we need to really take into effect and listen to equally. Just a point of information, we wouldn't be the f uh, first Board of Trustees to pass a board policy regarding this. The details would obviously be outlined in the administrative procedure. So the overall concept of gender neutral bathrooms, multi-stall would be what the board would be discussing. The fine tooth details would be then outlined with the um, input of all members of 
this college. It's the concept of multi-stall gender neutral bathrooms, not the details. Um, and it is uh, very much so um, a board decision since it has been decided um, and implemented throughout many boards in the United States. Yeah, I don't think it's pushing it off. Anyway, I'm thinking, I mean, I, I see the emails that Mr. Geraldo has been doing conversations. I don't know. I mean, I don't even know. I don't know. I don't know if we have money to, to hire someone to facilitate, but I know that when the whole TP thing happened, people ended up working, was it just communities that they worked with? Was yes. it just communities? Yes. So Jared, I mean, Jared is, their organization, had you, I, I, I'm envisioning people in our community that this is what they do for a living, this is their, their discipline, and this is sort of, um, and I don't know what the process was for the community here at City College, but I know that someone came in and sort of helped have these hard conversations for people on both sides because we, in this case, it was a you know, passionate group of students that you know, were doing an assignment, but it offended and it hurt another group of people in our community. Um, and so, it, I, yeah, so it's not to push it off, it's so that we can have these conversations in a way that, that's fair and that is respectful to everybody here. And I don't know how to do that. At that point, I think you know, Dr. Gaskin did, they somehow brought in Just Communities and Jared came in, and I don't know at what scope. Well, the ASG will be holding town halls regarding the, po the policy to answer any questions. That's definitely something that we, transparency is essential, and you know, there's, there's, there's no denying um, for the need of information, because in, in, every, in every aspect, this decision should be made off of information um, and facts and, and um, not false rhetoric. But again, um, it's just the overall concept of having um, some multi-stall gender neutral. And, and then again, um, the single occupancy are always open for those with traditional um, and or moral <coughs> conflicts with gender neutral, uh, gender neutral multi-stall restrooms. There, there, there are single occupants. Yeah, I'm, not, well. I'm gonna return to the idea that this is complicated and yeah, we're not just, gonna solve it tonight. Yeah, I don't wanna so, take one or the other. Um, I, I wanna, I guess, yield to Dr. Reby to see how, yeah. what, well, what Liz brought up, how would this take shape so that it, yeah. you know. And there's a budget area here too because it, it does strike oh. me that this is not nearly uh, as, as easy to pay for as has been suggested, it all needs to be in the mix. I mean, I don't want to talk it to people about it and assume that it is inexpensive. So we need to look at all those pieces. Two, two aspects of this, and Emily, you, you nailed it in terms of information. And as we've talked, uh, education, and that was brought up with the speakers. Um, the sense that I'm getting is that um, we, the board hasn't been educated on the topic enough to be able to entertain um, a board policy at this point. Not, and I haven't heard anything in terms of them being negative about it. I think that they just, they just feel inadequate in terms of their knowledge base about it. And so I think that that has to happen probably first is my sense of it. Yeah. And then secondly, we have a, a process that Dr. Butler pointed out in terms of how the an eventual board policy, should that be what the board desires to move uh, in that particular direction, but um, we have a process for that. Um, it, I don't get the sense that anybody's ready for that at this point, but we have a process to be able to make that happen should they uh, choose to move that direction. And when you're talking about informing the board, are we talking about as well the community aspect of that? Informing uh, the community about? Well, input, basically, mm -hmm. I guess is what I'm questioning. I mean, I think that's what I hear in Veronica's comments, that mm -hmm. this is not a, you know, just us issue. There's a community there that yeah, is paying right. attention and interested in, in uh, and presumably has opinions. Well, that'd be a process that we'd have to define. Yeah, it's not something we normally do, right. but it might be appropriate. Peter. I think you're exactly right on the notion that uh, I don't think anybody here is necessarily opposed to the suggestion. We, we are interested in seeing how it will work. Uh, there are concerns. We should take those seriously. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't want um, whatever we do with this to be interpreted or potentially misinterpreted as ducking it, as pushing it out of the way so that we uh, you know, we, we just let this thing go. 
I, I, you know, I'm speaking just for myself. I'm, I'm very interested. I'm serious. I want, uh, I want to find a resolution that is acceptable to, uh, to all sides, and I'm, I'm convinced that that can happen. Uh, so, um, I, I'm just a little concerned that by pushing it off to BPAP, but maybe that's, maybe they won't do that. I mean, I, did, I just don't want it to get buried. Yeah. I think we want to see it back here. I, I would agree with you. We want to see it back because it's, well, it's, it's a national issue and now it's affecting us. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you have to, I look at, sorry, my career was in sales, so I always try to see the other side of things, understand both sides, because you can't sell somebody something unless you know that they really need it or want it. And um, I, uh, I'm very concerned about, you know, trying to push it too hard because the general public out there is sitting there and they're working every day and they come home they see if they see this on the news or they see it in social media or something um, they think well that was a national thing that doesn't affect us here our schools don't have that problem and it's it's like it's okay with them but it's I don't want it in my backyard kind of thing and they don't really have all the details and so it's an educate as one of the students spoke up and said it's an education issue and you can't educate the public that voted for us, that supports us, you know, real fast in one slug. So I don't think this is something that can happen really fast. I'm not saying I'm against it or for it. I'm saying that I think we, I believe that we need to deal with it. And I don't have enough information to make a decision or to even contribute to writing a policy at this point. So that, that's all I, that's my input. And so I would agree that it's good to take our time, learn about it, and let's, I don't want to kick the can down the road, but you can't do this overnight. All I want to say is that I think this conversation is a good indication of why we need a policy on policies, because then it provides a clear path of how we interact with BPAP, how if a trustee mm -hmm. has an idea, like what happens, because right now it is unclear, and I think that might be causing tension, is, you know, AS made this policy recommendation. Emily is on our board and wants to push it. And she can submit it to BPAP, but it's not, you know, it's not publicly clear what happens and when it happens and how it gets to us or whether we talk about it first, then it goes to BPAP or BPAP talk, like, or we talk about it generally, then, it, you know, there are so many little things that it's confusing people. Yeah, but I, 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 think, I think what the, the key is here is, is not, is keep it simple, we're talking about it. We're going to watch it. We're going to talk to other people as much. Well, we can, can't talk to each other so much about it, but we can talk to others, and we can talk to Dr. Beebe. And uh, we're not kicking the can down the road. We're, we're going to look at it carefully. We're going to try to study it. And I'm sorry we can't do it in a week, but we'll. I guess what I was saying is the discussion was following whether we have the action next meeting, whether we have the action to approve the policy next meeting. That's what was this. That's what, you know, that's what this conversation spiraled out of. What I'm saying is if we had a clear policy on policies, then it would be clear what we would be discussing next week. Maybe we're not voting on it next week, but we could discuss general parameters of a policy, then it goes to BPAP, then it goes back to us. I don't know. We don't have a policy on policies. I think well, I, I, we have pieces of it, but I think, I think we yeah. can get there, so. I think you're overly optimistic about creating a policy on policy that yeah, is I don't. clear. I mean, once you have it, I'll, I'll, I'm sure I can find some way of working around it or through it or on the other side. No, that's how you table things. You just, okay. yeah, you create another path. <laughs> this is really not a discussion at this point. I appreciate that you have a comment. Maybe. Is it an alternative way? Bring it to you? No, we're not. No. Not voting. Um, we're, I think we're at the point where we're not going to make it an action item. So, um, What we talked about was whether we would make it a discussion item, and I think we have asked Dr. Beebe at this point to give us his input on what this process is, and at the same time, we will try to have that draft <laughs> policy for po on policies to come back for discussion. I mean, really that, as Jonathan says, may be a prerequisite um, to our actual substantive discussion. We'll see. 
So to be clear, to go back to the ASG tomorrow, um, should I be telling them that our next step will be to be going to BPAP because the, the board does not feel ready to make a decision on multi-stall yeah. gender neutral restrooms or should I say that this will be another discussion at board level? No, I think what we're saying is Dr. Beebe will consult with BPAP with Academic Senate and who, those and the association groups government. that normally are involved in policies and policy. PAT. And um, we will also look at the bigger process and then we'll get there. Oops, here's Pat. I'm sorry, I have to jump in here. We have a board policy on policies and yeah. administrative procedures. It's board policy 2410. Uh, and I then there's know. an administrative procedure that's associated with that. So that might help Jonathan actually, answer some of his actually questions. Actually, I don't think it fits no, this fine. situation. I have looked at it, and it um, confuses some of the things that we're now struggling with in my mind. So, okay. so I'm trying to, that's what I mean, though, by there's pieces of it there, but I don't think there's all aspects that we need to pull, into, pull together. Can I make a comment really quick? Sorry. Oh. Um, okay, so there's three weeks left until the next board meeting on April 13th, right? That's about three weeks. That's three weeks for the board to get educated. I mean, there's David, many. Um, I don't think we're going there. I appreciate you're passionate about moving this forward, but we, we need signatures. a lot more going on. If you knew the process here, you would recognize, I think, that it takes a while for all of the groups to have their input on something, even if we stick just with the campus. Right, I just, I just want to say one last thing and then I'll leave it with you guys. Every single second that a student has to walk to a different building to use the bathroom is an injustice. Just like every single second a black student could not be in the same classroom as a white student is an injustice. So waiting to get educated, waiting, waiting, waiting is injustice. Standing by is an injustice. I understand that you feel very strongly about it and I think we hear that. I mean, we should but all be feeling strongly we need about to hear this. it we need to hear all viewpoints, and, and I think there are more viewpoints that we need to incorporate in this process. Can I ask one more question? Did we have to, David, did we have to no, view? You're pushing it, guys. You're we, pushing it. <laughs> did we have to uh, view all viewpoints on um, desegregation? David, this yes. is not a debate. We did have to Yes, we yes. Did. No. Yeah. and wow. I lived through it, and I was active in it, and I was on the position you're in now. And the fact is that I learned that if I couldn't list all the other viewpoints and the answer that I had to those viewpoints, I couldn't convince anybody to desegregate the schools. But didn't I just do that? No. Well, no. no, you didn't. No. No. I didn't. No. You, made, you made your, you put okay. together a strong speech, but you didn't do that We should go back yet. to the record because I think no. I can address that, but thank you. All right, um, plenty of debate here. Priscilla, did I leave you out since David got his turn? Yeah. No matter what the topic is or how emotional or how important it is, I don't think it's a reason to ignore an established process which is in place. So I want to, I, I'm perhaps being repetitive, but I want to be clear for any group, whether that's the students, the faculty, the classified staff, or the administrators, to go directly to the board and make an agreement somehow just with that group and the board is outside of our process. We need to involve everybody, and we do have a process in place for doing that, and, and I think it's critically important to follow that process, and I think it's, important to recognize for, I know how passionately the students care about this issue, but it's important to recognize that for any change to occur, it takes some time, and it may not feel like there's a justification in that, but, but not following the process really is something that we can't do. Thank, Thank you, Priscilla. You. Appreciate that. Um, and frankly, that returns to my original concern about really deeply understanding those different viewpoints which Marianne just spoke to. All right, we are adjourned. Emily. Did you want to talk? Okay.